Good morning. That's my first thing. <laughs> I think I've spoken to most of you on your way in anyway, but I don't know about you, but I love this time of year. Spring. I just love it. I just love it. I love seeing the new growth all around. There's new things appearing. You know, the excitement you get when you see that first snowdrop of the year. Have we got our first snowdrop? There we are. There we are. I remember this year for me and for uh, Dawn, uh, not Dawn, sorry, Heather and Duncan and Dave, we were on our leadership day away and at the lunchtime we decided to go out for a bit of a walk, a bit of fresh air, clear our minds a bit. And we were in Bleasdale over, uh, is it Ribble Valley? Bleasdale, yeah. Uh, and it was a really bleak day. When, when was it? Was it January? Yeah, so it was really bleak, it was cold, it was windy. And we were walking up this hill and we were all bundled up. But there, under this bush, was this little snowdrop just peeping out, pure and white, you know, just giving that little glimpse of what was to come. And I think when you see a snowdrop, you always get that glimpse of what is to come, don't you? And, uh, and then, of course, you start seeing the buds appearing, don't you? The little tiny buds, and then they swell and swell and swell, and then these beautiful, fresh leaves we can't walk anywhere without me stopping admiring the little leaves because when they open you know they're just so fresh and green aren't they that color is just so vibrant and then of course they grow and grow don't they until they've got this beautiful canopy i mean we're very fortunate aren't we we live in a, a very green country you know and then we've got the new life in the lakes and rivers haven't we uh, do any of you remember doing this i used to do this when i was a kid collecting frog spawn me and my sisters, we lived near a golf course at the time and we used to go out with our buckets and we'd get all this horrible gelatinous stuff, there it is. I wouldn't touch it now, it's funny what you'll do as a kid but you won't do when you grow up, will you? But you pick this frog spawn up and then you take it home and you put it in your fish tank or whatever. We used to have this old stone sink that we put it in, in like a shed at the back. And uh, we put it in there and then of course you start seeing your little tadpoles emerging, don't you, and wiggling about and so much life in them. And then the froglets appear. And they are actually called froglets, if you don't believe me. I have done my homework. They appear, don't they? And then of course you have to go and release them back, don't you, if they survive that long. Can't say I always had a 100% success rate one with that one. And then, of course, one another of my favourites. I just love this time of year, so it's, I'm, I'm very enthusiastic, as you can hear. The little ducklings. You know, those little cute, fluffy ducklings. I challenge any of you not to utter an awe oh when you see those. You know, I mean, they're just bundles of loveliness, aren't they? Waddling along after their mother down to the water. You know, it makes us all stop and think, doesn't it? You know, then more recently, of course, moving it out of spring, you, you see, see, start to see the first swallows and swifts of the year, don't you? Yeah. And that's always a buzz, isn't it? When you see that first one, I saw you post this month ago. Very good timing. You know, it says, us, doesn't it, that one swallow doesn't make a summer. Now I've seen two. So we're on the way. We're getting there. One the weather is coming. You know, and uh, hopefully more and more will arrive. What do you say? Heat wave, yeah. Heat wave. Okay, so where am I talking about this? What's this got to do with communion? But I want to look at firsts this morning. We've had a bit of a first. I mean, you've probably done it in the past when we haven't been here, but uh, it was a bit of a first this morning doing the worship like that, wasn't it? So today will be the first time we've done communion since Easter. Can you believe that? Easter seems so long ago, doesn't it? But it is the first time we've done communion since Easter. And it got me thinking about firsts, first times for us all. Now the word first means coming before all others in time or order or foremost in position, rank or importance. Just something to think about there. So have you ever wondered? I do a lot of pondering in the quiet moments, <laughs> not with as many, but have you ever wondered how the disciples must have felt when they met together for that first time after Jesus' death? You know, they watched their friend who they followed faithfully die in the most brutal way and take his last breath there on the cross. They put him in the tomb. They must have been devastated, wasn't they? We've all felt, you know, a lot of us have felt that. And even though Jesus had told them, and before he went, in John 16, it says, I am going away, but the spirit of truth will be with you to guide you. So he told them, they knew it was going to happen, 
but it doesn't make it any easier, does it? There still have felt that sense of loss, that emptiness, that bereavement, and they'll still have had that anguish in their hearts. Dave, do you want me to swap mics? No, All right. <laughs> so many of us here today will have gone through that loss, maybe some recently, maybe not so recently. You know, and even if we know we've got that promise that we will see that person again, it doesn't take away the physical loss of the person, does it? That physical ache that you feel. And we all deal with it differently, don't we? We all have to deal with loss in different ways. There's no right or wrong way to deal with the loss of a loved one. But for the disciples, and all, those, all of us who know and love Jesus, we're not left alone, are we? As the promise he said to the disciples is the same for us. I'm going away, but the spirit of truth will be with you to guide you. And we've also got this act of taking communion where we remember that ultimate sacrifice that Jesus made for us, as we'll do in a short while. So another first I want to think about this morning is the first time we personally encountered Jesus in our lives in a real tangible way. You know, a lot of us will have uh, learnt about it in Sunday school or learnt about it in school. You know, I mean, they did used to teach Bible stories in school. Um, but that real tangible feeling, you know, when it suddenly, the penny suddenly drops and you know, it's, re it's real, is this? You know, this feeling. For me, it was, uh, I was about eight, I think. Don't quote me on that, but I was around about that age. Uh, and it was in Wesley Hall in Blackburn. And my Sunday school teacher, a lovely man called Colin Rickaby, uh, I can't even remember what he was talking about, to be honest, but I know that penny dropped that day. And I really felt, even though I'd gone to church all my life, uh, all my life, up to being eight, you know, all those years, but uh, I'd always, you know, I'd learnt all the Sunday school stuff, but on that day, the penny really dropped. You know, we all have different experiences, don't we, of, uh, of, of that first time. When the, when the penny actually drops and you, you, you actually realise that Jesus is real to you. So I've just asked a couple of people to come and, and share that story, their story, of when they first became aware of what Jesus, who Jesus was. And I've asked Glenn and Louise to come up. And now Duncan and I have known Glenn and Louise quite a long time. We have children similar age, in that our youngest are there, they're the age of their eldest. <laughs> Not to make you feel old, uh, but they're just going to share a bit for us. I'll go first to get it over with, because I actually said he can do it and I'm, I don't want to do it. So I didn't do any preparation because I wasn't going to do it, but then I thought, yeah, I should do. Um, so I did make a few notes on my phone and I've forgotten my phone, so <laughs> anyway. Anyway, so I was just going to say I'm Louise, um, um, I'm 60 next year, married to Glenn, got three children, three grown-up children, um, and in 1984, um, I started, well, I started, um, was it 1984? I can't remember, no, it was later than that, I think, but um, I started my nurse training, and um, Prior to that, I'd always been brought up as a Catholic. My mum was a devout Catholic, went to church every single day. So I was brought up um, to believe in Jesus, God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. So I believed in the Trinity and I did believe that Jesus died for me. But I had a fear of God. I just felt like he was always looking at me, looking at the things that I was doing wrong. So throughout my teenage years, I had high expectations of myself, but... I seemed to break all the rules um, and I was very much into um, a part of my life that Glenn didn't really know but I was into clubs and I used to go to clubs <laughs> <laughs> I used to go to clubs on a Thursday night Friday night Saturday night and sometimes a Sunday and I was really into the acid house scene believe it or not <laughs> but that's but you're quite surprised at that <laughs> but I absolutely loved it and um, when I started my nurse training, I met somebody called Alison, who Duncan knows. Duncan actually ended up going to Bible college at the same time as Alison. And somebody said she was a born-again Christian. So I was like intrigued by this, and I thought, what's this born-again Christian? So I was watching her all the time, what she was getting up to. Sorry, I'm losing my cardigan. And um, 
Um, and then I followed her into the toilets one day. She went in the toilets and um, I said, are you a born again Christian? What's that? I want, what is it? I want to know all about it. So she told me all about it. I was a bit confused thinking, what's she waffling on about? But then she invited me to um, an evangelistic rally, which was led by Billy Graham. And at the time, she just said to me, do you know Billy Graham? Do you know who he is? And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I know who he is. Because on the commercial pub, the old commercial um, hotel in a church, there was a great big poster and it was in red and white. Well, at the time, there were local elections and I just thought, oh, he's a Labour candidate. <laughs> so, because, so because I was a Labour, I thought, oh, yeah, I'll go and see Billy Graham. So I actually went on a coach with, with all these people who were talking about God and Adam and Eve and I thought, what's going on here? So when I got there, um, I was quite confused. Um, Cliff Richard was singing and there was all sorts going on and I, I wasn't really listening. I was just thinking, what am I doing here in Anfield? And, um, and then at the end, people were going forward and they were giving out free packs. So my friend Alison said, do you want to go forward? And I said, what for? And then she said, well, I'll come with you if you want. So she, she urged me forward and I got this free pack. So then these really nice people were praying for me. And I thought, this is a bit strange. But then a couple of weeks later, I had a phone call from, um, if you remember, Joan Heap. Joan Heap was a, a lady who... Um, and her husband, Les, who came to this church for many years. They're both dead now, but they lived on the same street as my mum and dad. And I knew John and Les were Christians because I used to walk the dog for many years. And they supported me through the death of a close friend who I used to walk the dog with, who died suddenly. He died in a car crash. Um, and I knew they were different. I used to go around and get the dog and they'd be singing and... Les was always making scones, so they took. So I, I met up with them. They they connected me up with a house group, um, and this house group was in various people's house. Sometimes it was in Don and Sylvia's house, Steve Townsend's house, um, and the people were just lovely, really nice people. Um, oh, sorry, that means I'm waffling on. That means I'm waffling on. So I connected up with these people and then I started going to the old Melbourne Street Church, which was previous to this building. Um, I actually went for a couple of years and I, I, had, I still had one foot in the Catholic Church. I'd go there in the morning, go in the evening to um, Melbourne Street and then in between I'd still go to clubs. So I didn't really know what I was doing. But... Everyone was so lovely. I mean, Mick and Sue, they were always answering all my questions about everything. Um, and then one day, Richard, who was the pastor at the time, he was preaching about the Holy Spirit and about um, having colour in your life. And um, the, everybody was singing this song. I get so excited every time I realise I'm forgiven. And I was singing it, and I felt like I was on a fence watching everybody. And... Um, I said to Richard, I feel like everyone's into something and I'm not. So he just told me a few simple steps and he just said, have you ever actually um, said sorry for things you've done wrong? Have you ever repented? Have you ever actually asked Jesus to come and be Lord of your life? And I hadn't. So I thought he was going to take me in a room and say, right, let's do it now. But he was rushing off somewhere and he just said, well, I want you to go home. And just I lived with my parents at the time. And he said, just in your own room, just just go through, say that. Just be really honest and open to God. So I did, and I, I knelt down, and I, I, felt, I felt like Jesus was in the room. And he was standing there, and he was holding a, a present. And I'd, he'd given me the present, and I'd been holding on to this present for nearly two years, coming on and off to the church. But I'd never actually opened the present um, and I just felt like the pres I opened the present and it was all sparkling. And this I just felt an overwhelming peace. So when I went out of the room, I wasn't any different. But I just knew that I knew God and that he was real and he was personal. And prior to, prior to that, for, for many years when I was um, younger and even when I was doing my nurse training, I used to drive to work in a little red mini. And I used to have this question in my head who am I? And I used to say my name in the car and I'd say, I used to be called Smith, I'd say Louise Smith, 
who am I? And I felt like I was nowhere, but suddenly I just knew that I was part of his royal kingdom and um, that he loved me and as if I was the, it was as if I was the only person in the world. But uh, obviously since then, um, you know, we've had struggles, struggles in our marriage, struggles with our children, we've had problems with our children with um, suffering from mental health problems, but all I can say is that there's no looking back. I can't imagine what life would be like without God in my life. You know, we've gone through COVID, people go through bereavement, all sorts of problems, but it's just amazing that, um, you know, he's always there. You can just, like Alison said, you can go for a walk, you can just look at creation and just listen to him and hear his presence. So sorry if I've gone off. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. I've got problems in my marriage, that's all right. Ready, is the first? Oh, it is loud, it does hold it away a bit. Right, here's the first, putting the Gregory Peck, so that's a little Right, anybody intelligence in the room? Hang on, hang on. <laughs> We're struggling. We're struggling. No, I'm just joking. Right, Mark, Mark it more, it's intelligent. Right, myth. Can you tell me what is the definition of myth, please? A myth. What is a myth? Very good. Good morning. I'm so glad I asked you. That's, <laughs> that's very, very close to, to your definition. In the dictionary, it says this. Do my eyes look big with these on? One minute. He says it's a widely held fable, belief, or idea. So that's what a myth is. Some people say that uh, Darwin, where I'm from, is originally where the Garden of Eden was. <laughs> Darwin says that's a myth, but I don't know. I think it's true. <laughs> anyway, moving on. Some, another myth is that Burnley are a good football team. That is definitely a myth. My opening, set, my opening line is, Glenn Fox from Darwin, 61 this year, I've done nearly 30 years in prison. And uh, people look at me who don't know me, this lady over here, she's just thinking, wow, what's he done? The good news is, is I've got, got a set, set of keys. keys. <laughs> got called me to the, the prison service, service and joined the, the prison service, 94, October, 94. It's been a real privilege uh, yeah, speaking to, to, to murderers and all sorts of folks, telling them about forgiveness because forgiveness is there. It offends some people that some staff get offended that we can talk about forgiveness because they shouldn't be forgiven. But you know what I mean? When you turn it around, look in the mirror. Because when you point a finger, if you're from Darwin, you've got three pointing back. If you're from Burnley, you've got more than that. <laughs> no comments. Anyway. So anyway, anyway we're, we're talking about myths in the jail. I'm a PE teacher in prison. I started as a prison officer and then a workshop instructor. So we're talking about myths. I said, what's a myth? And this French girl, she says, it's like a little butterfly. I said, no, that's a moth. <laughs> she says, like a myth. I said, no, that's a moth. But, so we moved it on quickly. So I'm gonna, we, our testimony, me and Louise, we've got we like chalk and cheese, different backgrounds there. But the testimony is before, how, now. So I'm going to talk a bit about before, what I was like as a, as a young man growing up in Darwin. Come from a family of six, two brothers. We were all big lads. Uh, we found we were pretty sporty. In fact, a teacher at West End said, are you from Darwin? I said, yes. Are we all very sporty? He didn't mention academic. Play for the town team, football, etc. And I found I were pretty good with my hands. And I don't mean making things, I mean punching people. And I had a bit of a nickname as Foxy Fast Dance, and uh, I was known as a one punch man, which is not a good title to have. And I don't brag about that. And I look at my audience when I'm speaking because I go into some serious violence, etc. with the football, gang fighting, usually related to alcohol. And I was very much into that type of scene. Right, moving on. I used to have a weekend, I was into the, to, to the punk scene, don't remember, so when I walked into Melbourne Street, I was probably nearly seven foot tall, we can soon know, because I had a big red weekend as well. 
now I've got to back to front more he can he can more I said I've heard down the middle not on the sides but what happened was I was into all that scene a lot of my mates got into heroin a lot of hung themselves they're dead because of the path they followed in life some of them laughed at me when I became a Christian at 20 but here I am 40 years down the line so what happened was worked in this engineering firm my foreman came in one day big six to three hurry biker Jesus loves you on his motorbike helmet and I went what the mm -mm -mm has happened to you so he started answering me questions and at the same time Dave Shore who we know well the lad in Darwin they didn't know each other but it was God's time and he became a Christian and he used to come and talk to us and a lot of the punks and uh, we were all on the side and some were sniffing glue etc etc and Dave used to come and talk to us and there was something clean and attractive about his life because he is this guy who'd been a bit of a boy or telling me to clean my life up you know and uh, so I started search searching it, it ignited a spark in me to seek after truth right so and the Bible says if you seek for truth you will find truth you will find Jesus so wh wh wherever you are in Darwin in Africa wherever you are if you seek for truth you will find Jesus so if you're a Muslim and you're seeking for truth you'll find Jesus you know so that's the bottom line so I started asking questions I'll tell you what I thought Christianity was a myth I thought God was an artist and I thought he was called Harold because of the Lord's Prayer our father he does art in heaven I thought he was an artist Harold is thy name so I thought he was called Harold but uh, that's a joke though. <laughs> <laughs> you're the stone they're gonna stone me here I said right so anyway tough ground so uh anyway there's answers to a question a lot of questions about evolution and creation and who made the world etc etc but i'll tell you what when you dig into things it's the, the evidence is there we can't prove god somebody said you can't prove god i said no but i can talk about fish and chips you can taste it and you can taste and see god is god and you can experience his forgiveness so some of the stuff Mark we were talking about last week, I went into all that, the uh, evidence that the man's heard, the Josh McDowell, because the Bible says we need to be prepared to give an answer for the hope that we have in us. So our faith is on solid ground. So I made a decision at the age of 20. I said to me, before, I want to become a Christian. I believe Jesus died for me. I believe I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner because I'd hospitalised people and stuff like that, which is I'm not bragging about so anyway so I mean, yeah so he said abc i said what, what what's abc he said hey i make you a sinner and you're a sinner b believe jesus died in your place on the cross and i believed it c this was a tough one count the cost counting the cost as a young man 20 in my prime people say what are you do becoming a christian in your prime 20 some people were offended some people told me dad they were offended that i become a christian what's offensive about that it's to knock people out you know what i mean and then i'm talking about jesus and feeding people and helping people so so, so before, before that's, that's the how by seeking, seeking the now married for 31 years like what he said it's not easy life life is not easy but we've got Jesus in the boat when the storms come. Some people on the lake, they didn't have him. But we do. So that's right. I'm still so work in jail. Just uh, went to go back. I'm just pushing the door see if you can pray for me. Uh, whether to go part-time. We always keep saying, you know, we're part-time. Uh, but uh, please pray for me on that one. Well, the doors could open. God called me to the prison service, so it might still be in the prison service, but I might be able to just work a couple of days a week. So, for waffle on there. Thank you. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, I was worried this morning that I wouldn't have enough to say, but I think I picked the right people, didn't I? <laughs> It's going to be very short, Duncan, but it won't be now, so it doesn't matter. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate that. Have you learned something new about them today? Yeah. Oh, well, I have. <laughs> Acid house, as if. <laughs> Who knew? And I'm sure if you want to talk to Glenn or Louise more about what they've said, you know, if anything's just niggled a thought in your head, go and have a chat with them after with a brew. I'm sure they'll uh, enjoy talking to you. 
So we all have different memories, don't we, from our first encounter, and it's great to look back and hear, see, you know, what happened and where we've come from. But it's great to look at how our lives have changed since then as well. Believe it or not, I'm not the same as that eight-year-old girl that first encountered Jesus in that real way. Uh, and I haven't always walked alongside God in my life. Um, but did whatever I did in my teenage years. And then as a young adult came back, you know, and the rest is history, really. You know, but let's just want to take a minute. You know, we've heard a lot there. Let's just take a minute of quiet just to remember that first person in our journey and thank God for them. You know, and you might not be in that position yet where you've met God uh, uh, really and personally. Uh, but, and if, but if you're ready to do that, if you feel like, oh, you know, I like what I've heard this morning, um, you could just ask God quietly to reveal, yourself, reveal himself to you. So I'm just going to be quiet for a couple of seconds and then uh, I'll carry on. So we've looked at the first meeting of, for the disciples after Jesus' death. We've looked at the first person to introduce us to God. And I have one last first, if you can say that. Can you say one last first? Yeah. The final first I want to look at is priorities. What do we put first? Remember the definition was coming before all others, foremost in importance. So what's the priority in our lives? And believe you me, this is a message to me as well as everybody else. In an ever-changing, ever-busy world, it's easy to make the wrong things our priority and to be distracted from what is important. Be it work, hobbies, sport, TV, phones, family, all of the above. You know, they're all things that come to take our time, aren't they? And it's not wrong to give time to these things, so long as we have them in order of priority. Obviously, some or most of us have to work, and it's great to come home and switch off and relax at the end of the day. Uh, but we do need to prioritise, to put things in order. First things first. Now, I'm really fortunate that I've just recently started a new job, and I work in a Christian environment in an organisation where most of the staff are Christians. And every morning, uh, well, I say every morning, most mornings, if the phone's not ringing, we get together and pray together. And it's only five or ten minutes, but we just commit that day to God and the, and the uh, environment we're working in. And it says when we put God first, all else will fall into place. In Romans 1 verse 8, Paul says, First, I thank God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is being reported all over the world. In 1 Corinthians 4, he says, I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. In Philippians 1, 3 and 4, I thank God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. So you're picking up a theme here. In most of Paul's letters to the churches, he starts with, I'm praying for you. I'm giving thanks for you. I'm putting you first. That's what he puts first. He's getting his priorities in order. Before he starts telling the churches what he wants to say to them, it's not always good, some of it is. He always put, says he's praying for them. So what do we put first? What's the first thing we think about in a day? After you've had your first cup of tea, of course. I'm sure for some of you, your first thought is to thank God for the day ahead, that you've woken up healthy, you've breath in your bodies for another day. But for me, if I'm honest, it's my thoughts are often, right, what have I got to do today? Who have I got to see? What have I got to, got to speak to? What hours were my working? You know. Who's got the car today? There's all these things that will invade your mind. But if we remember what Jesus said to the disciples, the spirit of truth will guide you. So if we put God first, before we think about all these other things, he will guide us. Now I don't want you to go away from this morning feeling condemned for flicking through Facebook. Believe you me, I spend a fair few minutes a day or more on Facebook. Uh, as we heard Dave on Wednesday, you know, it can be a great tool. It can be a great way to share your faith. That would never be my intention to condemn anybody. Because uh, like I said, this message is as much for me as anybody else. 
But what I really want us to do this morning is just to try and refocus our mind. Use this morning as we're taking communion, just to refocus our minds on what is important, what we want to prioritise, what we want to put first. So it's examining yourself as well. So as we take communion this morning, uh, we're going to remember all that God has done for us, taking that ultimate sacrifice and giving his son up to death. And I'd like to take a moment just to focus, like I say, on what our priorities are. What are we putting first? So I'm going to ask Heather and Mark to come up. They're going to give us uh, give the communion out for us. Now you might, uh, most of you here will have taken communion before. If you haven't, uh, it's a simple act.